It's not dream time anymore. If you're in the morning, it's coffee mm. time. If you're in the evening, it's beverage time. But most of all, it's science time. You the music. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. From now on, we've got to share the drugs before the show. Okay. <laughs> we can't just go taking them all as soon as we get our hands on them. Oh, science. It's the only drug I need. It is the reason for this show that we're going to do the podcast that we are recording tonight. And we are going to be starting in just a moment. I do have a title. I do have a list of things for you. I'm not going to hit the red end the broadcast button. No, <laughs> I'm not going to do that yet. That comes later. Some things like this will be cut out of the podcast, but other things will be all included. You are here for the whole shebang of the science this week in science brings. Starting in three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science episode, episode, episode. I'm having an, a day of a sode. This is <sighs> Twist. This Week in Science episode number 824, recorded on Wednesday, May 12th, 2021. Stop shouting and listen to the science. Welcome to the show, everyone. Tonight, I am Dr. Kiki, and we will bring you science to fill your head. We're going to do that. We're going to fill your head with giant lizards, magneto sharks, and poop. But first. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The best part of being a human is having a human brain. One that is good at understanding how things work. Yes, there are many other aspects of being human that are full of merit and noteworthy of praise. Art and science, agriculture and cooking, architecture and engineering, woodworking and ceramics, medicine and midwifery, pantomime and puppeteering, all the things we are proud of as humans originate from the seemingly basic ability we have to understand how things work. Thanks to our big human brains. Being a human with the ability to learn and understand how things work is such a magnificent superpower that it is constantly amazing us with new wonders of innovation and ingenuity. We have such capacity to think and do, to learn and create, to imagine, to build. With a brain like that, there's nothing humans can't do. There is, of course, that rest of our brain, the ape brain, let's call it. And while it has its uses, understanding how things work is not high on its list of things it cares about which is why most politicians are successful, why many television shows get watched, and how economic systems work. But with so much attention being paid to entertain the ape brain, you might think the amazing human brain would get bored. And you would be right, because you have an amazing human brain that knows how things work, which is why we offer you this mostly ape brain-free episode of This Week in Science, coming up next. The kind of mind that can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I wanna know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science Good And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We're back with more science. Another week, another seven days of fantastic exploration of the world. And yeah, my monkey brain enjoys this and all the science. And I have a lot of great stories for you today. I have stories about poop, but not just any poop, really old poop. I also have a fossil mm -hmm. turducken, 
And mm. I, yeah, yum, yum, except it's like an aquatic variety. Yeah. And also very old. <laughs> <laughs> and I've also got Magneto Sharks. Justin, mm-hmm. what did you bring? Uh, I have a recap of a review of Where Humans Come From. A uh, a record for the slowest something ever. Uh, <laughs> something? I don't was, know what. It was really slow, Yeah, that's though. the part that's a mystery. That's, a, that's the <laughs> catch. Is the, the teaser is it's going to be the slowest something, but you won't know what it, what it is until... So the story. Uh, a, a, a update on giant lizards, giant marine lizards, I should specify. And uh, a, one of those negative, I guess it's a COVID story. It's a negative outcome of the being locked down type story. Hmm. Um, a few negative outcomes out there. Hopefully Blair has some positivity in the animal corner. I do, do have you? some pretty lightweight fun today. I have a... Okay. Uh, the birds that are best at Instagram, yawns, and I have smells. Of course you brought more yawns. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's Blair's yawn corner. <laughs> <laughs> I made sure to eat a lot of chocolate before the show tonight, so I'll be set. No, so you'll be crashing just in time for the animal corner. No, no, that's not the plan. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as we jump into the show right now, I want to remind you that if you have not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can find us on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitch. Follow us, subscribe, hit the like button if you haven't done that yet, get the notifications. You can do all that so you know when we go live. We are also on most, if not all, of the podcast directories that are out there. Look for This Week in Science, and our website is twist.org. All right. Ready for some science? Good. Yay! Okay, first story is a pretty big one. Um, Researchers have been working on genetic modification, gene therapy cures for a whole bunch of single nucleotide uh, mutation disorders. Uh, And there is a particular immunodeficiency that researchers have been working on for quite a while trying to use gene therapy to to fix an ad- adenosine deaminase deficiency. It's ADA. This is also known as ADA SCID, which is immunodeficiency. It is also known as bubble baby disorder. Oh, yes. It used to be bubble boy, but it also is found in girls. So instead of worrying about that issue, it's bubble babies. because And it's also noticed very, very early, soon after uh, birth very often, while a baby is still a baby. Anyway, it results in children not being able to exist in normal society because their immune systems really do not function the way that they should. They get all sorts of of infections, and any infection can be life-threatening because they have this adenosine deaminase deficiency that leaves them unprotected. Their immune system doesn't work. Well, these researchers researchers have been working for years trying to create viral vectors that could introduce the, the fix into the immune cells, the white blood cells of, uh, of children with this disorder. However, there have been side effects because of the viral vector that they've been using previously. So several years back, a group of researchers got together and they changed their tact and they started using what's known as a lentivirus. And you may have seen this in the news already with headlines like AIDS virus being used to save bubble babies. It's not the AIDS virus. However, it is in the same family of viruses. It's a retrovirus and it uses uh, line one retrotransposons to get themselves into the cells. And anyway, these this lentivirus, they did a clinical trial. It is published in New England Journal of Medicine, a study with 50 children who have been followed for several years. They had a 95% success rate. Wow. And when it went bad, it didn't go bad. It just didn't work. And so the two kids that didn't respond to this immune therapy, this gene therapy, 
they were able to use other treatments uh, like bone marrow transplants or medications to be able to, to continue to live, just it didn't work the same. However, the kids in which it has worked, for they've been following them for about three years, and these kids are living like normal kids. They don't have to take... Uh, they don't have to take antibiotics. They don't have to take drugs to help their immune systems. They don't have to go in for shots weekly to stimulate their immune system to produce cells. They have, they're normal, and it's working, and it's lasting. And um, what, this, what they do is they, do, uh, they go in, and they get stem cells from the kids. They harvest CD8, uh, CD38 stem cells. And then they transfect them using the lentivirus with the, mod- the genetic modification. And then they, they put the cells back in and the cells get back into the body. The cells don't get rejected and they're working. Wow. Yeah. That's so, awesome. Yeah. It's a, I mean, it's, we're going to see more and more of this kind of gene therapy um, to to help. It's not a cure necessarily. We don't know how long it's going to last. They, 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 but they haven't seen any problems so far. Um, you know, maybe this is the kind of thing that kids need to have a, a booster shot, mm-hmm. maybe at some point as they grow. But uh, for now, everything is going well. Small group of kids, but then again, this is generally a small population in the first place. Awesome. So we have, we're going to have a future without bubble children. Right? Wow. They really, were, they were mo- movies very... that are made in incredibly bad taste are, are not going to have any cultural <laughs> connection anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were they were all they they were all over pop culture for a, a hot minute in the late yeah. 90s. Yeah, they were. <clears throat> yeah, there was I remember there was a one young it was a young boy who yeah. they, they were uh, trying to get get coverage for the plight of kids that have this disease. And so they were pushing the story in the news and they were pushing the angle. And, you know, maybe part of that, um, you know, the the PR aspect of getting the disease into the public consciousness pushed researchers to, to really work harder to find a cure for it. But um, regardless, maybe there will be a day when it there are no bubble babies. Yeah. That'd be great. Rad. Yeah, Justin, what do you got? What do you What do you do? Bring? I can't speak tonight. <laughs> what would you bring? Let's see. Uh, okay, uh, I have. Let's start off with the the slowest something. Uh, we we live in a world that is very fascinated with speed. How fast a thing can be is the very definition of some sports, like a car race, a bike race, boat race. Uh, we do this on sled, ski, speed skate in. Horse racing, dog racing, human racing, all of it, uh, heart racing. Don't fall behind. Got to keep pace. Life is, after all, one big rat race, but some things are meant to be slow. Sloths. They, they're mm. meant to be slow. That's just sometimes. how they are. That's just how they roll. Uh, yeah, sometimes. But there's not a lot of quick snails either. Yeah. Uh, tortoises, I think, generally speaking, are, are moving their own pace as well and then uh there's also a uh, uh, runner shizu kanakuri who finished the 1912 olympic marathon in 1967 having stopped briefly to get married raised six children 10 grandchildren before crossing the fish finish line 54 years eight months six days five hours and 32 minutes after he began the race wait what didn't yeah, they, it was, they didn't say the race is over? No, that doesn't, we, that doesn't we, count. Done. He has to spend the whole time on the track <laughs> for that so, to count. So what's funny is he spent quite a bit of time. He competed in other Olympics after that. Uh, and he had already been a, a record holder of uh, at least one Olympic race, or well, at least of one marathon race previous to this. But apparently uh, the 1912 Olympics had an unseasonally hot spell. I think it's in Sweden. Uh, had this hot snap. One runner died. Only half of the people that started the race even finished it. But there was a thing where if you didn't finish it and you didn't die, apparently, uh, you reported <laughs> that you hadn't finished it. Uh, 
Shizu apparently got uh, stopped the, in the middle of the run, got taken in by some farmers because he was so dehydrated from the heat, uh, recovered, and then just went back home and never reported anything. So uh, Sweden had him listed as a missing runner. They just didn't know what happened. And so some years later, they find out, oh, there's this uh, 70-something-year-old man uh, who was in is the one that was listed as missing. He can technically still finish the race. <laughs> so, but, and, but he finished in 1967. So yes. that's not what your story is about because that didn't happen this week. Yeah, exactly. No, that has nothing the, to do with what, this story. That has okay, absolutely great. nothing to do with this story. Oh, okay. But because you asked, I gave you the rest of the story. Of that story, anyway. But the story I was counting <laughs> about to tell is totally different. Uh, and that is the Engano Island earthquake, which lasted for 32 years, which is a very long earthquake, you might think. Yeah. Uh, it's actually the slowest ever recorded earthquake. Uh, it uh, culminated in the 1861 Sumatra earthquake, which was apparently a very devastating uh, earthquake in its time. This is according to researchers at Nanyang Technical, uh, Technological University, Singapore, NTU. Uh, the NTU research team says their study highlights potential missing factors or mismodeling in global earthquake risk assessment because this wasn't supposed to be a thing to have a 32 year long earthquake where uh, things just keep sliding and keep sliding and keep sliding. Uh, this t so these things, these do exist. They are thought to these uh, slow moving earthquakes where you don't get a, like a big hit on a Richter scale. You don't see, uh, feel the tremors and all that sort of thing. Yeah, because this is my question is what's the difference between a long earthquake and a slow earthquake? Because mm -hmm. you said it's 32 years long. That's a long earthquake. But what makes it slow? That's what makes it slow. Is it? So this is just a, this this slip sliding uh -uh. event where the, it's it's moving along one plate mm -hmm. is moving along another plate just slip sliding is just like slip oh i'm gonna wait a little a little more of a slip yeah. it's like if and you're trying time, if you're trying to happens. balance on a hill and your shoes are slipping down yeah. like eventually every, you reach the bottom well every like, time you have one of those slips you have a release of energy and then you would have a recording of that release of energy. What they're saying here is this 32 years just kept moving. There was no tension buildup and catch. It was just kept sliding. The so were whole they constantly time. recording some movement no. then? What no. they used, interestingly, was coral formations huh. at the bottom of the sea. The coral just happened to be in the right location for them to see coral where it shouldn't be. Uh, and they could see that it was this coral formation that it was crossing, this this plate line was crossing, moved at a steady rate of formation uh, from the coral uh, away from it. So basically what this it says too is because they didn't know that this was supposed to be a thing, it means that we may have completely misunderestimated uh, some of the tension buildups and other faults because these silent slippages were known to be taking place. Yes, they had been known to be taking place, but uh, over short periods of time, you know, maybe several hours, maybe a month of this activity, but not prolonged decades of, of moving at paces of a centimeter a, a month or a centimeter a year, whatever the ranges are. Uh, so, Slowest earthquake uh, ever recorded, 32 years huh. in the making. Huh. 32 years. Mm. I don't know. I feel like one. we need a new word for that. That's not an yeah. earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an earthquake, right? Or it's not. It's a, it, it, it is. is. It's a slow motion earthquake. Because there is slow. apparently, you know, some way you can recordable aspect of it. Okay. Hmm. It sounds like just geological shift of some sort. I, you know, like an earthquake, this, but taking a long the story, time. Yeah. Honestly, honestly, is more about the the marathon runner that finished <laughs> fifty four years. Oh, when you really come to it, because that's a bigger record than a than the, a slower record than the thirty two year earthquake. It is. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Blair, what's your first story? <gasps> oh my goodness. Well, I had to bring this story because it studies the most Instagrammable bird on the internet. And the winner is uh, definitely one of my favorites. So oh, yeah. I, I agree with Instagram in this case. So this is a pair of researchers from the University of Constance and the University of Jenna. And they found the most Instagrammable bird. How did they do that? They set up an, a measurement index. They call this the image aesthetic appeal. So basically just counting likes isn't good enough because some birds are posted more than others. Mm -hmm. So how do you decide which bird is objectively the most engaging in Instagram? So they n index nor uh, normalized numbers of likes across time and reach. They looked at 27,621 pictures of birds that had been posted on Instagram. And after applying their index, they found that the <gasps> tawny frog mouth <laughs> is the <laughs> most Instagrammable bird on the internet. Really? Absolutely. Hadargus strigoides. So... Here's their thing. So previous research has shown that Instagram colorful likes birds. bird likes big mouths. Yes. yes. So um, okay. that would be my interpretation of this story, but that's not how they interpret it. So okay. that is why I like frog mouths. However, previous researchers uh, looking just at likes on social media found colorful birds to be extremely engaging. But when you kind of normalize it, partially because most people don't even know what a tawny frog mouth is... <laughs> Then you start to see that they far and away are the winner. And they think that's because of where their eyes are. So their eyes are in the front of their face like an owl, but the rest of their head doesn't look like an owl. So it looks like a bird that's like a cartoon that's looking straight at you. And they said that also it doesn't hurt that they often look very mad. And that is a human expression. So you can relate to it. And it's very engaging if you think about social media and getting interactions and things like that but so so what we need to know now is whether the tawny frog mouth really is angry or just mis misunderstood they're they're not angry they're just does angry. it have but <laughs> resting frog mouth face yeah, yes resting frog mouth face. they either look mad or um just mo so discombobulated um but anyway is it just me do they or do they look british they just look British. No, they are Australian, <laughs> so maybe they're related. They they were sent so. off to the the prison island. But anyway, um, I think this kind of stuff is just it was fun, so I threw it in the in the quick stories. But it also is important for knowing, okay, if toddy frog mouths are extremely engaging, and we need to talk about Australian wildlife and conservation, maybe I'll pick a toddy frog mouth for the front or something like that. Right. So it is important to know what animals are the most engaging and how to leverage that to create mm -hmm. meaningful engagement. So that's kind of the, the serious side of these things, but also just the frog mouth one I had to I had to report out. How can we use one species to lead to engagement with other species? Yes, indeed. I like it. I like it a lot. All right. So moving away from the tawny frog mouth, I would now like to take us away from the land of Instagram and Instagrammable moments to the world of poop. Who says that's not Instagrammable? There's a world? <laughs> oh. There is a world. There, of I'm poop, sure there's there? a hashtag for that, but I am not looking it up. Um, Anyway, researchers publishing in Nature this week have analyzed DNA from fossilized poop, coprolites, preserved feces, however you want to say it. Uh, they took these, hu these human-created rocks uh, that were found in human rock shelters in Utah and Mexico that date back about a thousand years, um, or actually a thousand a thousand years before uh yeah about a thousand years they were excavated almost a hundred years ago and stored in a museum so they've been around for a while nobody's done anything with them and a bunch of researchers said hey i wonder if we can try and do dna analysis they are they're not so old that the dna in bacteria that's fossilized would necessarily have completely degraded. So perhaps there's a chance that we can compare 
ancient human digestive systems with modern human digestive systems and take a look at see which bacteria were in our guts back then compared to which bacteria are in our guts now. The coprolites yielded 181 genomes, according to an article in Science Magazine on their news site. They uh, were ancient and they were different, notably because of the fact that they lacked Can you guess what they lacked? Antibiotic resistance. Oh, I was going to say like uh, uh, lactose. That's yeah. (laughs) Lactase is what I meant to say. But um, that's not a bacteria. But um, that's interesting. Of course they would. Yeah, they, they, it was pre-antibiotic bio, biotic use by medicine. And so uh, people hadn't figured that out yet. And so it, there were no markers for antibiotic resistance in the bacteria in these guts. In eight samples from a relatively confined geography and time period, they found 38% novel species. So species that they have never found in human guts before. A treponema that's bacteria... True. It's uh, not known in industrial in, in the industrialized gut microbiome, um, but they're present in every single one of these old poos. So they think it's not just diet that was shaping things. So if you want to go on the paleo diet, it's not necessarily going to get you back to the gut that our ancestors had. <laughs> okay, can we jump on uh, Dr. Justin's not a real doctor. Paleo microbiotics. That's right. Um, so the bacteria were oh, different. It. it wasn't just because of the food. There were other things at play. They don't necessarily know what the dynamics were. Uh, but according to this research, um, everybody, everybody's microbiomes have changed. We have evolved and so have our microbiomes over the last thousand years. We've lost a lot of species of bacteria potentially, um, but we don't know whether or not our bodies have had time to adapt to the loss of some of these species that we're not, that we don't see anymore, these novel species that were discovered. Well, and we also gained, I'm sure, quite a few. And some of the ones we gained might be use, serving the same purpose as some some that we lost and maybe better reflects our current diet. And there's, there's lots of things that could be going on there. But I also see <laughs> there being really bad consequences of this, like, thawing and accidentally getting in someone's lunch. <clears throat> <laughs> so, no, no, causing no. all sorts of problems. So Getting first of all, they're first fossilized. Of all, they're it's not they're frozen. Bomb. They're fossilized. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But this. But does, they can this... sequence them. Um, you know, this is this is not totally beyond the realm of science. This does <laughs> lead some credence to my theory of aliens, of what aliens are. Because I've I've long predicted because aliens, whenever somebody has described the little gray men, they look too human to be from anywhere but the earth and -hmm. their technology is too advanced to be anywhere but from the future. And what do they do when they get here? They probe people's colons. Why? (laughs) They get microbiotic samples that they can take back to the future because there are certain things that just went extinct and they need a good current sample. So all those alien abductions, all those things flying over the waters, it's just microbiologists from the future. Please give them the space to do their jobs. <laughs> um, and one interesting note from this, uh, this paper is that at the time that they were collected, these feces, coprolites, mm-hmm. uh, were not uh, considered human remains. However, conversations oh. with tribes in the Southwest uh, led them to understand that those tribes felt that, they're, um, that they were a link to their ancestors and they were upset that there had been no previous consultation. And so this is the first paleo feces paper that contains includes an ethics statement uh so it's just something to think about as we're looking back in time especially for those of us who are in the united states in north america south america um as we're dealing with human history and human remains of 
of any kind. It's it's human history, um, and it's a link of some sort. These are conversations that are ongoing, and you can't just take coprolites from a camping site. That's wild, but also makes sense. But yeah, that's that's really it puts a, an extra layer on on the relevance and the uh, the kind of the implications of that kind of study. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But again, these were taken 100 years ago. Um, so it's good that the scientists doing this study took the time to have these conversations and to mm -hmm. uh, to include the Native people in the conversation and to have yeah. an ethics statement. I, I, and I am, I, you know, I am so torn on this. I, just, I mean, I'm so torn because I just want like science first. Find out first. Don't be afraid of the information. Let's not have bodies in, reinterred with no testing. Uh, you know, the, these sorts of things. Like, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's frustrating uh, that you have to have that conversation. I understand why, but it's still frustrating. It's very science uber alles, sort of. But I don't think it is there's a fear of what's going to come. I think it's a respect for history and a respect for tradition and people's cultures and yeah. But yeah, anyway. I totally agree with that part of it. It's yeah. just that there's there's remains that like Kennewick man. There was conversations about whether Kennewick men should be ever tested and that sort of thing. And I'm like, yes, and then he give it back. But and they give it back. Test. They don't need the whole but, thing for testing. keep a little. But yeah. test it for first. Yes, <laughs> Do you have another story, Justin? Oh, I sh uh, should. I had. Uh, I oh, yeah. This is the this is the kind of time. Uh, so this is uh, some important news to anybody who's trying to have babies in the midst of a pandemic. Almost half of women with babies aged six months or younger uh, met the threshold for postnatal depression during the just the first COVID-19 lockdown. And that is more than double the average rates for uh, Europeans who were studied in this before the pandemic. But um, how was it in relation to the rest of people who didn't just have children in the midst of a pandemic? Was it higher so, okay. than the background rate of depression? <laughs> Yes, yes, uh, absolutely zero uh, uh, people, men or women, had postnatal depression uh, if they didn't have children. That's not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the so there's a difference. And of course there is, but <laughs> I, I'm just I'm I'm being snarky about I'm my poking response. a little interesting item here. I just I'm saying I know they're separate, but also depression in general is peaking yes. during yes. lockdown absolutely and now here's depression and a screaming three-month-old baby and you mm -hmm. can't take them out of the house uh or hand them off to the grandparents or mm -hmm. hire a babysitter or i'm gonna say that friend, is a huge or... huge part of it i mean mm -hmm. the, the the social connection yeah. after you've had a baby is mm -hmm. so important and when mm -hmm. you don't have it when that support <laughs> network is gone Yes. Uh, That's hard. There's yeah. a okay. story of, of uh, my, my mother's friend, Rosie, running with arms outstretched uh, as she got close to the windows at the front of my house. <laughs> or as, as I was an infant, infant baby, newborn baby, for fear that my mother might have gotten to the point where she needed to throw the baby out the window. <laughs> Didn't happen. But there is like times when especially for a new first time mother, the stress level of this plus the hormonal imbalances and everything else. Postnatal depression is a very real, very common thing uh, that you need help. So, so yeah, so there's a lot of this reporting. This is uh, one of the, one of the things I thought was sort of interesting. Uh, okay. So yeah, the more contact new, new moms had with people, either remotely or face to face, the fewer depressive symptoms they reported suggesting reduced social contact, uh, as you were just exactly as you were saying mm -hmm. during the lockdown may have increased the risk of postnatal depression. However, 
uh, where women had maintained some face-to-face -face contact with uh, family members outside of the household, they were actually more likely to have depressive symptoms than women who saw fewer of their relatives. How weird. Interesting. Well, yeah. Uh, hmm. Interesting. And then I immediately made me think that, you know, maybe we give better support to friends than we do... <laughs> Then we do to family. To family, we might give uh, advice. Sure, sure. But we tend to be, I don't know. I just thought, actually I thought of it in reverse. I thought I have my kids who, who, halos. You can actually see the glowing halo when they are with their teachers. You can actually, <laughs> but as soon as they're at home, it's like, ah, parents, I don't have to teach you. Like the people interact a little different. So I think having that outside of your family contact is an important uh, aspect of that social interaction as well. But yeah, that was a very, that was a very interesting uh, aspect of this. But this is, yeah, with the, the takeaway from the researchers is it really does take a, a, a village to raise a child, mm -hmm. especially when dealing with all these increased demands and stresses. Some of the reports that were coming out of this are statements from the mothers uh, first time mother saying it's it's like working without the the guide uh, book. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, a lot of worry that children were not getting development that they deserved or mm -hmm. needed, not getting enough stimulus, that they themselves weren't doing enough, uh, and that they're just exhausted. Just the, the because exhaustion it, is going to be mm -hmm. huge. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. so yep. if, if there's any mothers out there, if you know a new mother, uh, let's just do Mother's Day again. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we need to keep. <laughs> We need to keep Mother's Day for uh, at the forefront throughout the this the rest of this pandemic. And always, always the mothers. Come on, always. they build humans. <laughs> uh, so, I have a story that goes back in time a bit, and it's a it's marine biology at its heart, mm -hmm. but. It's a fossil. Again, I, I guess I really like fossils this week. Researchers published in the Swiss Journal of Paleontology, a fossil that had been found, um, which they call a leftover fall event. And this was a crustacean that looks like a lobster ancestor. Crustacean being eaten by a squid uh, that had just been eaten by a shark. So the fossil that they found, they described as a, um, <laughs> they had, they described it as a belemnite, the belemnite, uh, and the other, a crustacean of the genus Proarion. Proarion had a body reminiscent of a lobster with long, thin claws, and the belemnite was in great condition so that they could see that this squid-like creature, the belemnite, had had an large part of its body torn away by a shark. You could see the teeth marks from the ripping away of the body of this squid. And it had, the squid had died, fallen to the bottom to the sediments while it was itself tearing apart <laughs> the proarion. So first of all, really rare to get a good fossil of a squid. Yes. They're so they soft. had a great one. <laughs> The, uh, let alone, which is let unusual, alone. the, yeah. the proarion, which they said, uh, had a body reminiscent of a lobster. That one wasn't as great. And what they think is that it was possibly that it had, that it was just, uh, shedding its skin or had just shed its skin. So it hadn't completely, its exoskeleton mm -hmm. hadn't completely firmed up at right, that so point. So it was soft so and it, squishy. <laughs> It was soft and squishy as well. Yeah, but they, um, yeah, they found, they observed how these fossils looked and how they appeared to have fallen to the bottom of the sediments and determined that, yes, indeed, it's like an ancient marine turducken, hmm. the crustacean eaten by the squid, eaten by the shark. <laughs> Very hmm. rare. Very yeah. rare to discover such it, a fossil. It, uh, it reminds me, uh, there's a <laughs> short movie I don't know if it was tester footage or just the short film uh, of Jurassic World, uh, 
where at the very end during this, the credits, let's, they have this little clip of, you know, that, that classic uh, South African great white shark throwing a seal up into the air and uh, mm-hmm. grabbing it. So it's that. It gets flung up. The shark goes up out of the water all like, wow, I'm a bad, I'm a bad shark. I'm going to eat the seal. Gets the seal. And then this mosasaur giant marine lizard comes out and uh, swallows up <laughs> shark while eating while it's eating the seal. Uh, yeah it yeah. happened i'm sure it happened yeah. all the time while there we have evidence yeah. yeah while a predator is after its prey it's not necessarily checking its tail Mm-mm. it's yeah. like i'm Very such much. a big bad predator i'm gonna eat this lobster ow it's, it's been like going on very... for years yeah. <laughs> so the shark got a good meal in the end blair you have another story yeah um Speaking of uh, getting bites taken out of you, uh, decapitated flatworms can still sense light. <laughs> so How? This is, yeah, this what? is like my third week in a row of invertebrates getting chopped up into pieces. Yeah. This is from the Institute for Stem Cell Science and Regenerative Medicine, the Technology and Research Academy University, and the University of Hyderabad, all in India found that flatworms are able to sense light exposure after decapitation. So this is looking at planarians, a type of flatworm. They have two eyes, which are connected to nerve cells in their head. They don't have a lot of complex organs, but they do have them. Prior research showed that their eyes can sense ultraviolet light, and when UV light is shown on them, they wriggle away. But in this new piece of research, they cut off their heads and they continued to sense light and wriggle away <laughs> without any eyes. So they can survive having decapitation and regrow their heads as we know. So in the meantime, they can avoid UV damage by sensing the light and moving away. They also found that when the flatworms were in a resting state, their body still reacted to light even in the absence of other sensory information. So that seems like these guys are just hardwired to avoid damage due to UV light, even when sleeping or without a head. (laughs) Don't hurt me. Yeah. So the question is, who else has these weird abilities to sense UV light, even when you can't see it? Yeah, that seems to be the question for the last three weeks, too, is like, what like, what else can we chop up? Yes. Where, where, are, yeah, the sensory, where are the sensory organs? Where mm-hmm. is the control system? Yeah. What is the light? What is responding to the light to make that action happen? If we had thought it was particularly photosynthetic spots in the head region of the flatworm, but it's not... What yeah, else it turns is out it? you don't need your eyes to see you if you're a worm. Everything mm-hmm. that's happening around you. Well, I think that's it's that's a legitimate one, though. I mean, your skin, your eye, the eyes probably aren't that good, uh, frankly, on a worm Mm-mm. Mm-mm. to like see. Oh, there's the direction, there's the type. But uh, having a full body sensor that can pick up the UV and be alerting it to which direction to move away from, even uh, probably a lot, lot better system. This is This Week in Science. Thank you all for joining us. We really do appreciate that you're here with us to learn about science and talk about fun things. We're going to make you more interesting. Can you help make other people more interesting too? That's right. Tell them about twists. Help grow our audience. That would be really, really wonderful. Time now for the COVID update. Just a quick one. Do, 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 do. It's a quick one. The CDC director today wrote, Today I adopted CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommendation that endorse it, endorsed the safety and effectiveness of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine and its use in 12 through 15-year-old adolescents. CDC now recommends that this vaccine be used among this population and providers may begin vaccinating them right away woo sounds like a safer school year next year at least for middle school and high school students yeah and although uh 
kids tend, like we've talked before, there is a lower infection rate in children. The group of up 10 years old and over are known to are known to get more infections than the even younger aged children. Mm-hmm. 12 to 12 to 18 is a very sensitive range, um, especially in this period of time before this group were being allowed to be vaccinated. Now with the vaccine, it really is going to reduce risk. I mean, to have vaccine vaccines available for this population to be able to reduce disease incidence and severity of disease, this is, uh, it's going to be great. I hope that it makes school a whole lot more normal next year. Yeah, I mean, and I, I don't want to sound like a broken record every time we bring this up, but some of the newer variants are affecting children more. Yeah. And so this is how we prevent new variants from popping up and using children as little reservoirs. <laughs> so this is better for the kids and it's better for all of us, even those of us that have been vaccinated. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather not look at my child and go, hey, you little reservoir. How are you yeah, doing? Yeah, it's a little How reservoir. Cute little reservoir. <sighs> yeah, no. Um, other interesting news. Back in December, a couple of researchers posted on BioArchive their initial work suggesting that, um, that the SARS-CoV-2 virus could integrate itself into the DNA of cells, sim- similar to other retroviral diseases. And um, the data they presented in the bioarchive ended up w- in a, a Twitter fight and in, a, in an online fight between a whole bunch of researchers who said, you don't have enough evidence. That's terrible science. You haven't done a good job. And it was a big hubbub, especially as vaccines were starting to be rolled out and people in the science community were afraid that this story would provide fodder for individuals trying to promote conspiracy theories about the mRNA vaccines. Fast forward to this week and this new study that has come out in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. They have updated their data. They actually brought in as a collaborator a couple of the biggest um, critics of their original paper, of their original work. Uh, So they had their critics help them make their work stronger. The study is called Reverse Transcribed SARS-CoV-2 RNA can integrate into the genome of cultured human cells and can be expressed in patient-derived tissues. So we don't know what this means. Nobody knows what it means that parts of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, not even the whole virus, just parts of it end up in human DNA. Um, Nobody knows whether there are links between that and long-term health effects that we see in COVID patients. Um, But it is thought that this could explain why some patients, even though they don't have any any symptoms, why they don't test positive, why they may produce viral RNA after recovery, why on some tests they test positive for viral RNA. This could explain it. But other, as for the other, other aspects of implications, nobody has any idea yet. <laughs> it's not zombies, though. Not right? zombies. Not zombies. Um, and they say that uh, because it's only subgenomic sequences and it's mainly, they say in their abstract, mainly derived from the three prime end of the viral genome, Integrated in the DNA of the host cell, infectious virus cannot be produced from the integrated subgenomic SARS-CoV-2 sequences. So this is because they're they're little segments. They're not the whole genome. Um, They're not going to pop out and be, ta-da, surprise, you're infected again. And that's the part that will be lost on the majority of media when they pick up this story. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's it's. But it is integrating it, it. This gets back at a bunch of stories that we've talked about over the last year um, about how SARS-CoV-2 has really it enters into the cells and it just wants to make the cells its own. Like it so, reformats the hard drive. So it could <laughs> be <know>? zombies. <laughs> is what you're saying. So maybe. I mean, we, we don't know what these bits of 
retroviral DNA really want to do now that they're there? I mean, maybe they want to give us superpowers. Maybe this is how yes. we become Superman. I don't know. Yes. Yeah. Do you do a sonic cough? <laughs> I think I saw that an android in Raised by Wolves. Terrifying. Oh, yes. Or I guess but, some sort of superpower where you can't smell anything. Or maybe you're really good at smelling something. I don't know. <laughs> I hope, yeah, hopefully the opposite. Yeah. But... It's interesting. It's this is just the interesting, unresolved <laughs> curiosity of certain aspects of this virus and maybe other coronaviruses, uh, other SARS cor coronaviruses. Um, we don't know everything that this family of yeah. viruses does. And so this will give us more information about what it's all about. I, I do like the idea of, of humanity loses its sense of smell, but it makes the other senses that much more intense. Yes. <laughs> Ooh, I can taste everything now. Hmm. Except that would probably not be true. You'd probably kind of lose your sense of taste. Yeah, you'd lose your too, sense Because without the sense of smell. Yeah, but, but then we can hear everything that's going on at the neighbors. Yeah. The, I don't want to hear my neighbors. Yeah. But that's all I had for the COVID corner for the, the COVID update for this week. Just a couple of quick stories. And then it's time at this point to throw it on over to our favorite animal-loving, science-loving host of the show. It's Blair's Animal Corner. <laughs> With Blair? She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. Is that a What you got, Blair? Oh, I'm so. I'm just having trouble paying attention. I'm just yawning. So. Uh, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh. Uh, so a recent study <laughs> from Utrecht University, I'm clearing my throat and yawning all at once, it's just really, uh, um, it's Dutch. I don't a think a finishing school nightmare. Over they have there. that anyway. much in there. Uh, they do when I say it, but anyway, um, a new study looked at yawning. Once again, we've talked about yawning so much on the show. It's changed over the years on what we think yawning did yawning for so long was assumed to function as an oxygenation of blood but oh my gosh I'm yawning again. <laughs> you started it <laughs> instead this is all your fault um recent discoveries by the lab of gallup show that yawning actually cools the brain which I do believe we reported on the show pretty recently. So that is the, the newest theory. Seems to be pretty accurate. There's a bunch of, of uh, proof to that theory now. The, there's an inhalation of cool air and the stretching of the muscles surrounding the oral cavities that, <sighs> that increases the flow of cooler blood into the brain and has thermoregulatory regu function. So how they, they measured that was, for example, they tested the temperature of the brain. Basic, right? Uh, the temperature of the brain dropped rapidly after yawning. Ambient temperature determines how often yawning occurs. If you crank up the heat, they yawn more, which I just thought the, the heat would make me sleepy, and that's why that would make me yawn, but no. It's actually the differential between what temperature your brain wants to run at and the temperature outside, just like the fan kicks on on your computer if it gets too hot in the room, right? And they also found that people rarely yawn when you have an ice pack on the back of your head or neck or you do other things to cool the brain. Also something I've done before when I was falling asleep, but I assumed it worked just because it was kind of shocking to the system. So it would wake you up, jolt you awake, right? That's but what no, I would think that the cold would kind of keep you alert. Yeah, but this is just <laughs> cooling the base of your brain. Like this is cooling your <laughs> spinal cord. Your blood. Yeah. And so um so anyway, so all that to say yawning cools the brain. That's not what this study is about though. This study is about who yawns more in the animal kingdom and what that means for their 
smarts their brain if there's any connection there. Does a smarter animal yawn more, for instance? So we yawn about five to ten times a day. Sometimes. Darn it, Blair. I'm tripling that quota right now. Um, and so there was, been, oh, there you go. There was a strong indication that the dr- the duration of yawns are linked to brain size and the number of neurons in the brain. And so that's what this study is all about. This is an international team of scientists all centered around one biologist, Jörg Massen of I'm going to say it again, Utrecht University. And and it's it, not, they don't and, have and, the, it's much more similar to English than you That's how I'm going to say it, though. And Andrew Gallup of the State University of New York Polytechnic Institute. So they wanted to see if the length of a yawn is related to basically how many neurons you have. And they collected more than 1,250 yawns from 55 mammals and 45 bird species. And they did that by visiting zoos. <laughs> so they just sat around, had their camera on animals, and waited for yawns. And it did take a long time. They probably yawned a lot themselves while they were sitting there waiting for it. Um, but they wanted to see if the size of the animal, if the size of their brain, and the type of animal they are had anything to do with how long their yawns were. They linked the durations of yawns to brain and neuronal data, which was provided by previous studies by Pavel Nemec of the Charles University in Prague. They allowed them to uh, conclude that if you take out body size, the duration of yawning across species increases with the size and number of neurons in the brain in that given species. So it's, you're taking out individual changes because that's always the, the kind of the big fallacy that we talk about when we talk about big brains. It doesn't really matter how big your brain is within a species. What matters is how big your brain is on average in your species versus other species. And that's really what matters to what? intelligence. Yeah, so it, just, it doesn't matter if my brain is heavier than yours or yours is heavier than mine. That doesn't really matter. But the fact that your brain is bigger, heavier, and has more neurons than that of a dog, that indicates intelligence. So, okay. yes. So the, the duration of yawns across mm-hmm. species increases with the number of neurons in the brain. Hmm. Beyond more neurons, that, more blood flow, yes. more yawning. Yes. Basically. It's a heavier, it's a bigger fan on a bigger supercomputer. That's all it is. And so mammals also appear to oh, yawn God. longer than birds. They think that's explained by the higher core temperature in the body of birds. So the differential to it being too hot outside mm. is less. I think it might actually have more to do with the fact of the way that they heat and cool their bodies that we learned about just a couple weeks ago. So that yeah. they heat their body with their blood. <laughs> So it's it's a it's might a different a, system. That might have a lot to do it, actually. Yeah. Yeah. But so I think that was an interesting uh, connection that that I made by looking at the story. Um, but the brain functions overall best at an optimal temperature. Again, just like mm-hmm. a computer, right? And mm-hmm. so the 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 kind of piece of of uh, food for thought that the lead researchers leave us with at the end of this story is that perhaps, perhaps. Oh, God. oh you need to stop. Oh, God. Perhaps <laughs> we should stop considering <sighs> yawning as rude and instead appreciate that what's actually happening is the individual is trying to stay attentive. So basically this is like, I want to pay attention. This is important. I want my brain at optimal temperature. Let me yawn. Yeah. But then uh, we should make yawning be an acceptable thing when you're having a conversation, whereas instead you're like... Yep. You know, fighting the yawn, trying not to yawn because you don't want somebody to think that you're bored. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But uh, this is a very good uh, indication that it has nothing to do with boredom. It actually has to do with a deep desire to stay attentive. I need to be I, attentive. I'm not. I need to be per, attentive. Per, it's my okay, show. Okay, I'm not buying that at all. Okay. 
I, I, I mean, I've never been in one of those conversations where it's like, yeah, and then we should do this. This, oh, Gosh, this is a great idea or the creative collaboration or tracking down an idea or thinking through something and just everybody start going. Mm, mm, I think you get more sleep mm, than I do, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> or you're used to less. I don't know, but. Uh, Does that happen? Does your brain yes. overheat and you start yawning because yeah. it's such an I, exciting thing to talk I yawn about? all the time doesn't... when I'm in conversations I care about. All the time. Like right okay. now. That, that just doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, by the way, I apologize to anybody who happened to be listening to the show while it's making doing my a late eyes night water. of work or going on a long drive or anything yeah. where you're supposed to be staying awake right now. And we keep saying yawn and yawning on the show. No, but we're making them work. yawn, which is actually we're keeping you up. awake. So it's fine. Really, waking you up. Yes. We're really helping. Yeah. Stay awake. Stay but, awake, Gaurav. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, moving All on right. from mm. yawns to smells, <sighs> I have a story from Francis Crick Institute and University College L- London. <laughs> I can't say the word London today. Um, found that mice can sense extremely fast and subtle changes in odors and that they can use this to guide their behavior. So this is uh, part of a uh, larger conversation, I think, that that we have had before and that is part of a deep-seated belief that until now has been based on very little evidence. And that is that I think there are subconscious decisions that we are constantly making based on smells. So to that end, that's why I brought this story, obviously, to promote my own agenda. Um, but this study... <laughs> we allow you to do that here. Yeah, it's yeah, fine. It's, yes. it's, 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 I'm just going to present the study. I'm going to tell you what I think it means, but it's up to interpretation, baby. That's what this is about. So <laughs> um, this study was looking at odor plumes. An example of an odor plume is like walking by as there's steam coming up off of a hot cup of coffee. It's something complex. It's turbulent. It has a meaning, in, meaningful information, piece of information to it, um, but it is also brief, and it is dependent on position, and it's it's not a constant um, saturation of smell, right? So previously, it has been assumed that mammalian brains can't fully process temporal changes in smell because they're happening so rapidly, which is faster than we can <laughs> sniff. So if something is happening faster than I can intake breath intentionally or unintentionally through my nose, if I'm not forcing air into my skull, (laughs) then how can I respond to these odor plumes that are a fraction of a second long? And so that really is what this gets to, is there's some sort of passive response that's happening that is not related to the forceful movement of air into your nasal turbine. So they use behavioral experiments where mice were exposed to incredibly short bursts of odor. They used neural imaging. They used electrophysiology and computer models. And they found that mice can, in fact, detect rapid fluctuations with odor plumes at rates that were previously assumed impossible. The mice then use that information to distinguish whether odors are coming from the same or different sources. So they were actually able to behaviorally test them as well where these odor plumes were coming from and they were able to respond, even if they were close to each other. And you could see how in the wild it would be extremely helpful to know where a smell is coming from and be able to respond to it. But these really small 40th of a second blips of smell they're enough to influence mouse behavior. They were able to correctly distinguish between odors that were at this 40th of a second, that's 40 Hertz. And the the kind of, one of the reasons they were specifically looking at this is because of the olfactory bulb. It's, as we've discussed previously, the part of the brain where the nose sends signals to And the olfactory bulb has a lot of computational power. And so the researchers were looking at this saying, why is this olfactory bulb such a focus? Why is it so large? Why is it prominent? Why is it so powerful if it's being used for (laughs) occasional sniffs? 
if it's not directly related to species survival and it's not being used constantly, they would expect it to not be so prominent and important. I and am so, sensing a bit of anthropomorphism yes. in animals. I mean, humans, we think we don't use smell that often. We do. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of unconscious responsiveness, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, oh my goodness. I mean, the, to imagine that mice are not using their olfactory bulb for behavioral decisions, yeah. that they're not doing massive amounts of pro of of processing in the olfactory bulb right. when they have pheromones. We know they have right. a vomeronasal organ. We know there is a lot of yeah. scent stuff going on. They recognize the scents of their babies, their mothers, their their siblings. I think I think you're totally right here that it's it part of it has to do with the fact that it's hard for us to imagine responding passively or responding actively to passive smells that are constant and tiny and varying. And even though, like I said, I personally think that we do. Um, but yes, to, to because it's something that we're not aware that we're doing, let's say. It's, it's something that hasn't potentially been researched as closely. And so that's one of the cool things that came out of this study is that they actually were able to design new technologies like a high-speed odor delivery device <laughs> that could measure several odors simultaneously with extremely high precision. I want so, them to use this on a person in an yes. MRI. Yes, please. <laughs> Yes, please. Tell me which direction the odor is coming from. Tell me which yes. source. What, you know, what do you smell right now? Like, yes, why not? We use Let's pheromones. I'm convinced. We use pheromones. We, yeah. um, our, our memories are often related to smells. We have emotional responses to smells. There's all sorts of stuff going on that, you know, you have smell aversions. Maybe... You can't even tell that you can smell yeah. that thing that you have an aversion to. And it's so small and so slight, but oh gosh, your stomach doesn't feel good all of a sudden, or you're walking quicker or whatever. But I, yeah. I really, I, I think there's so much more going on like nasal turbinates, man. So our nasal turbinates are, are pretty small. They're about the size of a postage Ooh. stamp. But when you, unroll nasal turbinates from a dog they're about the size of a handkerchief and when you do that same thing with a grizzly bear it's about the size of a picnic blanket are you really telling me all of that all those cells and all of the nerves involved with those cells are just there for sniffing <laughs> i don't think so no yeah. it's constantly sampling i mean we don't have the moth, uh, the moth antennae, or you know, the we don't have these noodly appendages like, mm -hmm. like insects have that we just know they float on the breeze and run into the things in the air and they follow the plumes in the air because they're running into them and the chemicals are running into their antennae, um, and that's changing their behavior. There's, wouldn't that continue to be mm -hmm. constant? That even yeah. though we're breathing things in, it's not as direct, but I, things fly up my nose all the time that I don't want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there's also, I mean, but you've seen, you've seen animals do a concerted sniff. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where they're, 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 they're like, I, this is, this is me checking the air. And there's maybe like even a little bit of a head movement there to, mm -hmm. maybe it's a directional thing. I don't even know what's happening when an animal a dog or a bear is sniffing the air. Oh, well, for like, sure, it's all of it. But it's they're probably... really picking up on things that I can't even imagine are are present for, to yeah. be picked up on. And they're pro they probably picked up on something passively that is now cueing them yes. to mm -hmm. actively investigate. Right. Absolutely. Yes. And that's exactly what what this is kind of getting at. It's and think about so people who've reported on losing their sense of smell. We were just talking about this, right? Mm -hmm. um, from COVID. And they describe how strange it was. And I I'm just thinking about like, if tomorrow uh, you could no longer see any version of the color red at all. Okay, so tomorrow I see like Blair. Right, okay. so uh -huh. this is my point, is that I if you suddenly change. were missing an yeah. entire input, uh -huh. 
it would be jarring, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's that's where I'm. We there is an entire landscape of smell that is part of our existence that we take for granted. Mm-hmm. And it's part of our perception of the universe, <laughs> but we take it for granted because we can't see it. Yeah, that's right. I that's have a like... friend who can't smell. I'm going to go talk with her after oh. this. <laughs> so yeah. take me around. Tell me about the world. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> this is this is uh, very largely me. Very few signals uh, get identified coming through as a smell. Uh, I can smell almost nothing. I can smell really bad things. Like cinnamon. The smell of cat urine and cinnamon. Those <laughs> things get cut through and I'm like, oh, avoid. Stay away. There's cats somewhere. Or there's cinnamon. Uh, Christmas is an awful time of year. <laughs> they Because they begin to fake spray. I don't even know if people notice. I notice because it's one of the smells and I don't like it. No, it's aggressive. It's one of the smells I can yeah. smell. But they start scenting everything with cinnamon uh, yes. department stores grocery stores they're like spraying cinnamon on and things everything. to get people in the christmas mood but it's good uh, that your that your sense is even if you don't aren't consciously going look at the nice yummy smells the things i love at least it's alerting you to still the, the things warning that system. you don't like yeah, yeah, your warning, warning system, system works there. that's yes. good but yeah. the idea of this study is that you're not consciously aware but you are mm. making micro decisions <laughs> based on micro smells <laughs> so, that so you don't out, even realize. Turns out I might not really dislike that person as much as I think I do. It's just they were chewing cinnamon gum when I met them. And yeah. therefore <laughs> awful person. Maybe. Terrible Maybe. person. Maybe. I but I think that is the definition of a terrible them. person. Somebody who chews cinnamon gum is the definition of a oh, terrible man, person. I used to, to love with. cinnamon gum. I used to eat I so this is why I think I have cinnamon aversion is my grandmother's counter had the butter that was like soft butter that was left out it had I could use the toaster all I wanted and the bread was out too and there was a shaker of cinnamon and a or little bowl of sugar sugar and I was allowed to make as much cinnamon bread as I wanted it was the one thing at like I don't know age six or seven or whatever it was that I could go into the kitchen and just do myself. And I had so much of it, I think, that I oh, I think I overdosed on cinnamon at a very young age to the point where it's just been repulsive ever since. Maybe but you I, accidentally I cinnamon ton. challenged yourself. And yes. Like, I think I did. I really know. I think that's what happened. I think if a little cinnamon is good and a little sugar is good, more is obviously more, better. Great. And I just kept increasing and increasing. And then probably, yeah, had a I'll really just... bad... Uh, we're sorry we're doing a reversion therapy right now taking you back to your youth (laughs) sorry this is this week in science thank you all for joining us again tonight and if you are interested in supporting this week in science you can head over to twist.org and click on that patreon link choose your level of support and help this week in science bring science to more and more people your support helps keep us doing this show week in and week out and we really can't do it without you so thank you for your support and now it is the time for science from justin oh is it what you that got? time on the show again okay uh where did all the humans come from well first there was a rib and then okay 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 yep. let me no, clarify no, 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 no. when fish. i asked the question fish where all the humans came from i implicitly <laughs> reject denounce discredit openly ridicule <laughs> Any suggestion that the human species resulted from magic words spoken over a lump of dirt, a talking fish, fornicating deities of a cosmic egg origin, or any story that doesn't have a raven in it because it's obviously ravens. That one's actually true. Right, uh, of course. No. Where did we come just from? Fish, though? Just fish. So the thing is, right, there's fish, and but then there's there's a, that's a big jump to billions of humans inhabiting nearly every niche yeah, biome on the planet using up every resource. Because we're so, awesome. Because, well, we're aggressive. <laughs> we are aggressive. Pretty much. I'll give yep. us that. Uh, 
So we, you'd think that, though, we would have a pretty good idea of where these billions of humans came from. Uh, but we have no idea. Well, mm. we have some idea. idea. Lots of ideas, actually, which is great because that means that we've been thinking about it and we've been trying to figure it out. But the fact that we don't specifically know uh, is, is kind of a, a problem within anthropology because not having the specific answer means we have a lot of different answers that are coexisting currently uh, of, of, of best hypotheses of where humans came from. So, and, and most of them, pretty much all of them don't include ravens, which means they're all wrong. Uh, but in anthropology departments around the world, the sequence of evolution from ape to human has sort of different discussions going on because we're still in the midst of figuring it out. There's an interesting review uh, titled Fossil Apes and Human Evolution, which is published in the journal Science currently. Uh, and it sort of just looks at where we are as far as ape ancestry is concerned. And it comes to the conclusion, current evidence suggests that hominins originated in Africa from an ape ancestor, which may have been unlike any current living species of ape about six to 10 million years ago. So that six to 10 million years ago is thought to be when we diverged from our closest relative, which is chimpanzees. But what this is bringing up the fact is that there's such a radiation and diversity of ancient ape. There's a lot of apes out there today, but that's nothing compared to the amount of apes that were there previous to the hominin. Uh, yeah, brand. I mean, you have something with an opposable thumb. <laughs> that's how evolution works, right? They're going to try it a million ways and see what sticks. And even, and it's not necessarily even the opposable thumb because that's very sort of specific to the hominin uh line right so that's that's our that's our direct uh you know going no home, i mean all the great apes have guessing. thumbs uh but having it at opposable yeah like, that's the, i thought that was the thing that yeah. made it special anyway but but the the point the uh so there's that radiation of all the different hominins that we've seen yeah we've talked about that quite a bit how we're this braided stream of we got the neanderthals over here and the denisovans and the homo erectus interacting we got all the the hobbit creatures and some of these other things, the red deer cave people, like all these interesting hominins that seem to have been on the planet at the same time, maybe as many as eight of them at, on the planet at the same time. So there was a gr much greater diversity of ape uh, as well in, that, in the ape ancestor category with all sorts of different body morphologies going back through time. There's sort of a gap at around the 10 to 14 million year ago range uh, where we have very sparse records, which is exactly the period we need to be looking at to understand where the humans come from. Currently though, what's sort of interesting, some of the closest fits uh, are in uh, sort of Southern Europe, like Greece, or uh, some of them are in Bavaria. Like we have these, you know, sort of, more human looking leg gait in one area or more human looking torso somewhere else. You have all these different elements, but, but nothing that's like, that's obviously <laughs> where the human lineage picked up from. So we may have been a braided stream before we were hominins. We may have been uh, an ape braided stream before <laughs> we were even a human braided stream. So it could just be like, this keeps happening all the way back. And so it's a configuration. So, but some of the interesting things they're saying that, that our lineage ancestry may never have knuckle walked. Our ape ancestry may not have been tree hangers. We may have already been on there. Like there are so many different variations that we don't know where we came from yet. And that the ape ancestor of not just chimpanzees and man, but maybe gorilla and man had fewer traits in common with any three of us than we, what we might expect, that it could be that different because the radiations were so diverse, going back through the record. And, and, and sideways, having been looking at this, there was, oh, I think I might have closed the thing on it. Oh, here it is. Did you know there was a 10-foot-tall orangutan that weighed 600 pounds? No. 
Yeah, isn't that what uh, Christopher Walken played in the the newer version of the Jungle Book? No, I'm serious. I'm pretty sure that's what he was supposed to be. He was supposed to be that critter. It's it's sort of related to the orangutan. It it looks it only died out a hundred thousand years ago. Uh, Gigantopithecus uh, black eye, blacky. Uh, Distant relative of the orangutan, stood ten feet tall and weighed up to six hundred pounds or two hundred and seventy kilograms. The, it, the picture they have of him. it looks like Bigfoot. It look <laughs> it looks like what big you would expect a Bigfoot to look like. Exactly like Harry and the Hendersons type Bigfoot so, looking thing. So now you're saying there's a chance. I'm saying there's a chance. I'm saying there's a chance. But but that was only a hundred thousand years ago. And anyway, the diversity of the ancient ape is a whole other category that we have to go back through to try to find the origin ape. Point of the whole story is it's not going to be linear. Mm -hmm. The whole human and ape history, there's not a whole lot of linear about it. It's more complicated than we think. We like this nice tree-like, easily Mm -hmm. branching structure that we can follow, but... It's a bush. There's a lot more nuance. Yeah. 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 It's going to be right. It's going all the way down. Uh, And then... Uh, there's another radiation of creatures. Uh, we're somewhat used to the idea of a creature going extinct because it's a panda. It doesn't want to breed. Uh, it's a woolly mammoth. Uh, and the climate, uh, changed on the planet and now it no longer suits them or they were, uh, relentlessly hunted by humans, whatever the case was. There's usually some sort of a decline of a species that occurs ahead of extinction where they're being preyed upon or the the biome changes and there's less and less of viable mates. So time takes its toll and eventually a species goes extinct. Sometimes the extinction can hit when it, a life form is at its peak, when a species is at the very top of its reproductive killing abilities. Such was the case of a newly discovered uh, version of a giant marine lizard from the end of the Cretaceous period in Morocco, which reached up to eight meters long, which is Pretty, pretty big. That's mm-hmm. like a small school bus. That's like sure. the size of an anaconda. It's an anaconda. Anyway. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, the, that alone would be kind of cool, but this is also the third species of this giant lizard to be described from that region in less than a year. And it brings the total number of the giant marine lizards or the mosasaurs to 13. Mosasaurs, that's the giant marine lizard that you have seen in the Jurassic World puddle up front where they were feeding shark stew in the beginning of the movie and then like just shows up to eat things whenever it needed uh they were apparently at the height of their diversity and doing going really strong in the final million years of the cretaceous period that's to be going strong for a million years that's that's tough uh anyway with the uh yeah. Uh, oh, and then a giant asteroid hit the planet 66 million years ago, and that's and that was the end of them. Extinct. Yeah, the newly found species named Pluridens serpentis uh, had long, slender jaws with over 100 sharp teeth that were fang-like. Uh, it used to that to grab small prey like fish and squid. Uh, fun fact: they didn't eat humans. In fact, there's not a single case of them ever eating a human ever. Uh, They had smallish eyes, suggesting poor vision. The snout had dozens of openings for nerves, hinting at the ability to hunt by sensing water movements, change in pressure, that sort of thing. Uh, They also had, uh, they're they're distant relatives of sea snakes, and they're thought to use their tongues also to taste the water for molecular clues. And this is one version of it. Some of them ate, had had very different teeth for breaking up uh, crustaceans, uh, going after crabby type things. Uh, others others went after much larger prey and probably ate other mosasaurs. But uh, yeah, very different diverse beasts. Huge lizards. Uh, and they probably acted like them, despite the fact that their bodies very much resembled sort of modern day whales and dolphins. So, yeah. Diversity of life uh, going backwards is very fascinating. We sort of forget. The diversity of life. You go backwards, you kind of smash species of from today together. It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. lizard dolphins. Yes, of course. <laughs> lizard dolphins. Of course we had to try that. 
Crocodile it was, pandas. Apparently it was yes. very successful. <laughs> Crocodile panda. <laughs> you joke, but we're going to find it. I don't know. Could have oh, been. Boy. <laughs> what, Blair? Do you mock me? No. No, she's not at just all. Picturing, she's just picturing a panda with a big uh, crocodile, crocodile face. Crocodile. Yeah. That's right. It's, I mean, I think I was more around. look. I was looking at pictures of Mosasaurus because I wanted to make sure I was uh, correct before I said this. Mm-hmm. But um, they do look like dolphins in a lot of ways. But I think they look um, a lot more like crocodiles in their artist renderings but i think the the thing that's really important to like delineate um whales and dolphins from these aquatic reptiles is the way that they move through the water so um the the marine mammals go kind of up down which is why their uh their tail is kind of horizontal but reptiles in the water their tail is vertical and they they move more like a snake through the water left to right yeah yeah. And this is this is thought to be a relative uh, close closer relative to snakes and Komodo dragons. Yeah, which the way that I've seen uh, monitor lizards swim and iguanas swim seems like it would be pretty similar to the mechanics of They've how still I, got that that, uh, that fish like uh, 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 spinal motion. Yes. Very fishy. There's something fishy. Yep. Speaking of fish, let's talk about some sharks. Sharks? We have shark sharks? I have a shark story. Oh, wow. This one I love because we've been talking recently um, about navigation, and I taught, was talking about the, the possibility of these the uh, the picking up of these magnetic fields in the eyes last week. We had a whole conversation about that. And then this story popped up related to magnetic sense in sharks. Now, we know that sharks have the electric line mm-hmm. system that they use mm-hmm. the uh, use electric mag- electromagnetic fields for sensing their prey, for sensing communication signals in the water, for all sorts of things that uh, being fish living in the water, they make use of all of the uh, the sensory aspects that they can. And we also know that several pe- species of sharks undergo very long distance and very precise migrations kind of similar to salmon, where they, mm-hmm. they go from place to place. They don't get waylaid. They know exactly where they're going. How do they do it? Mm-hmm. Do they just look around and go, hey, I recognize this spot. It looks nice. Do they follow the other sharks? What the heck are they doing? Well, a group of researchers publishing in Current Biology this week trapped sharks and then messed with their magnetic sense. They... Mm-hmm. <laughs> which of course is what you do. They they trapped bonnet sharks, which are known for their uh, migration abilities. Oops, wrong window. Do, 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 do. Let me make share, make share, make sure. Make share. share. Make share. Make, share. make with the share. Make share with the right sh- pictures. Yes, so... They trapped sharks and then uh, took them various places on the planet away from the place that they had been trapped, um, understanding that by moving them away from where they had been trapped in the ocean, they would be experiencing a difference in the Earth's electromagnetic fields. And then they placed them in a big kind of Faraday cage and then exposed them to different magnetic fields to see how it changed how they moved around and which way they tried to go. And lo and behold, the end of the story is that they were able to show that these magnetic displacement experiments on these wild-caught bonnet heads showed that uh, magnetic map cues are what elicit their homeward orientation and that it is their magnetic sense that allows them to orient in the correct direction. And this is one of the ways that they are able to get themselves around out there on their migratory routes. Wow. Very cool. Well, with an entire structure in their face for 
electromagnetic fields, as you point out, <laughs> it would make sense that they use it for more than just finding food. Yeah, and these and these bodit sharks, yes, they they similar to kind of ham hammerhead sharks, where they have this feature of their head that is they use it for navigation. Their head is looks like a bonnet. It's bigger. It's a little more bulbous. Um, they're like baby ham. It's like they're. they're I think not they're very cute. They're cute. They are cute. Look at the big head on that one. Mm -hmm. So oh, how it, so how is it like out oh, we got sharks maybe the mosasaur had all those electrical sensors on its snout apparently uh, we've got pigeons we got all sorts of birds that are doing it got, what what uh, why don't we get to have uh, GPS built in maybe you do maybe we do yeah. we just don't pay attention to it anymore is that or is you that do and happened? you don't recognize like you know how you talk about how some people have a good sense of direction. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're just tuned in to their magnetic sense a little bit better. Yeah. Maybe they're mm -hmm. tuned in to the Earth's mm -hmm. electromagnetic fields. Mm -hmm. Maybe, though, I don't know, maybe we interrupt those fields too much with all of our electronics. Oh. Could be. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think, I don't think that, like, do we get, like, a bunch of birds and sharks uh, coming up the works in the big city just because they got, you know, power transformers and stuff? I don't know. No, don't know not happening. so much. Yeah, it's no. A different signal. The pigeons are still able, able to pigeon. They're pigeoning it's, just fine. They're though. still pigeoning just fine. Yeah. Yes, but bonnet sharks, they get home using their magnets. Wow. Yeah, the homing magnets. And then my final story for tonight uh, involves sticking wireless devices into the brains of mice. Wait, Be why? how is it? Oh, it's not wireless at that end. It's just wireless. It's the wireless end? in the mouse end. <laughs> so it is researchers, wireless. researchers have been trying to use optogenetics, which is a technique in which we can use genetic modification to make neurons stimulable by light. And by shining blue light on neurons, you can make animals do things you can cause different actions stop different behaviors you can make them do all sorts of funny tricks um, it's something that researchers hope that we'll be able to do eventually for uh, human behavior but in the meantime it's giving us a lot of insight into how brains work and when we're you when we're using this technology in mice currently it involves genetically modifying the mice so that they're brain can be stimulated by blue light and then sticking a cap on their head with wires that go down and a light that shines in these optic fibers down into the brain to turn the neurons on but then because this is electrically stimulated and and activated there are wires coming out of the top of the mouse or rat's head that are attached to a cable that goes to a computer and if you have a couple of mice that are trying to interact or even a group of mice suddenly you have mice tripping over wires and getting oh, no. tangled up in each other and so it makes real behavior very difficult to monitor yeah yeah so you're not really measuring real animal behavior mm -hmm. You're measuring this weird behavior of mice and rats with these things attached to their heads and getting you know, tangled in wires. So researchers wanted to figure out how they could fix that. And so they have. They have created a device, which is wireless technology, which can be like a little hat implanted. It's a little device that can be implanted into the, um, into the mouse's head. And so the mouse can behave wire free, battery free, or it's 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 battery powered. It's a re rechargeable, and uh, it's able to allow groups of animals so that they can examine social hierarchies and the interactions that occur oh. when different behaviors are changed. And so they are investigating how social bonds form and break in animals and so in their experiment mostly just a proof of concept and they will be investigating this more further with this new technology now that they're able to get groups of animals together to do stuff they're going to turn on and off the neurons that are responsible for social bonding and behavior mm. basically at the flip of a switch 
they're telling mice to play with each other, to interact with each other, or to be antisocial, and seeing how that affects group hierarchies and social dynamics. Play nice with your brother, or I'm going to flip the switch. I swear. <laughs> I swear. I don't know what's scarier, the idea of cyber mice or the idea that uh, they're playing with the ability to switch on and off human, or uh, excuse me, mouse interactions, which is used yeah. as a model for gosh knows what. Hmm. Yeah, so the, you know, interesting part of this, you know, it's implantable, and this is the kind of thing that could be implanted, and... If there comes a point at which we decide that optogenetics, that kind of genetic modification is allowable in humans, this would lead to the kind of technology that would control that kind of um, uh, behavior modif modifying technology in the human brain. Maybe you need to have something that's not a drug, but that turns neurons on or off to um, to calm somebody who has anger management issues or to uh, calm anxiety because anxiety, nothing helps your anxiety. And maybe you need something that can change that. Right now, there's not much we can do except for drugs. But with opt optogenetics and implantable devices like these, that becomes more of a reality. Right now, it's just studying mouse behavior. It's fine. It's fine, everybody. <laughs> it's such a slippery, crazy thing, though, which we always get into. I always get into trouble bringing it up. But like between human mental health and human control fears, there's that it's a fear. It, there is, right? Because it's your brain. It's a brain. It, it's this human is. Brains. And, and. In individuality is important. Um, in Western culture, it's very important to have your own choices, you know, to be able to choose your own path. Red know, whether pill, or not we actually do is up for debate, but, you know, to have that, <laughs> have that feeling of choosing our own path is important. Um, yeah, very interesting, yeah. huh? Hmm. Hmm, yes. Wireless controlled, implantable devices. Will this lead to mind control in humans? Story not at 11, because we're not even talking about that. This is just looking at the way that neurons work and the way that brains work to create behaviors in mice. Stephen in the chat room, yes, uh, is, is now planning to raise a mouse army. It's not a bad idea. Raise not a bad idea. mouse army. Cybernetic mouse army, I think, would be uh, pretty, pretty uh, overwhelming for most. Well, we aren't designed to fight mice. We just, our military infrastructure, our intelligence operations aren't designed to uh, to, to handle mice. Handle we'd have mice. to, we'd have to have this whole like, what's the dog? What's the dog that would hunt mice? Blair, you know dog breeds pretty well. What's the little, what would you have? Like, is it a oh, terrier? A rat, a rat terrier? Some sort of rat terrier. We'd have to mm -hmm. have like <laughs> legions of rat terriers defending the homeland from the cyber mice. The future is going to be amazing. Or you I can just wait. be the rat king from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Either way. <laughs> Either way. Yeah, the researcher from uh, from this study they took uh, says they took pairs of mice and when the mice were near each other, they wirelessly synchrony synchronously activated a set of neurons in a brain region related to higher order executive function that increased the frequency and duration of their social interactions. Desynchronizing the simulation promptly decreased social interactions in the same pair of mice. We didn't think this would work. Kozarip. Kozo, Kozorovitsky said, to our knowledge, this is the first direct evaluation of a major long-standing hypothesis about neural synchrony in social behavior. Brains that fire together, socialize together. <sighs> that does it for me, folks. Have we done it? I think We've we done did. It. We made it to the end of another show. Thank you. We made it. All the science. It was fit to talk about. Take it with you, everyone. Hold it close. And share it with your friends. That's right. 
tell people so that they know that the mouse army is coming? <laughs> this has been This Week in Science. Thank you so much for listening. I do hope that you enjoyed the show. I want to say thank you to Fada for your help with social media and show notes, Identity4 for recording the show, Gord for your help with the chat room, and to Rachel for your amazing assistance. Also, very, 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 That's a lot of varies. That's maybe too many Very many thanks to our Patreon sponsors. Not enough. There aren't enough thanks for our Patreon sponsors. On Ratnaswamy, Kira, Carl Kornfeld, Melanie Stegman, DeKramsta, Karen Tazi, Woody MS, Andre Bissett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vagard Shefstad, Hal Snyder, Jonathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Chioli, Guillaume, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Maddie Perrin, Gaurav Sharma, Shu Brew, Darwin Hannon, Donald Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin, Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rabin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Rails, Back Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Mark Mazaros, Ardiam, Greg Briggs, John Atwood. The profile name is hilarious in the context of some other podcast. Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Matt Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Depo, Sarah Chavis, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBells, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Stanton, Paul Disney, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And for those of you who are interested in supporting us on Patreon, you can find information at twist.org. Click on that Patreon link. And on next week's show... We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific Time, 5 a.m. Central European Time, Thursday. Uh, Broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org live. And uh, there's a whole list of places where you can find us. Yeah, so you can watch us live or you can listen to us as a podcast. Get some dishes done, fold some laundry. Just search for This Week in Science if our podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. And for more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes, links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. And you can also sign up for a newsletter. That's coming out very soon. Very soon. Um, you can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at This Week in Science dot com, Justin at TwistMinion at Gmail dot com, or me Blair at BlairBaz at Twist dot org. Just be sure to put Twist T W I S in the starting line, or your email will be spam filtered into a lobster that is being eaten by a squid, that is being eaten by a shark, that is also being eaten by um, a giant uh, marine reptile. Wow. Mosalosaurus. You can also uh, find us on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes through in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week.
week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. 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 And this week in science is coming away. So everybody listen to everything we say, and if you use our method instead of rolling a die. We may rid the world of toxoplasma, Gandhi, I, 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 Cause it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science This week in science This week in science, 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 this week in science. We did it. Oh, look who came back. What? What? It's the after show. After show. After show, this is the show that comes after the show. So, let's not be before. It's not before the show, it's after the show. How's that coffee doing, Justin? No, that's coffee. Yeah, um, it's good, it's not strong enough. (laughs) Needs to be more stronger, (laughs) needs more of it. Both. Yeah. Also, I a uh, bag of candy. I need to eat a bag of candy today. What? You ate a bag of candy? No, no, no. I wouldn't eat a whole bag of candy. That was yesterday. Today, what? I'm going to eat a bag of candy. <laughs> Should eat a bag of candy? candy every day. I think it's one of the. Don't eat a bag know, of candy. One of the food groups. groups. Well, you need no. You need candy groups. There's like more than one kind of candy. You need to get. Uh, some of each of the basic. You got to get some of the chocolate candy. You need a hard candy. You have a yeah, you need hard a candies. gummy type candy. You need a sour candy. A savory, you know, like a licorice, something like that. You got to get that a in savory. there. Too. Savory candy. Savory yeah. candy. What? You know, <laughs> like beef jerky. What? No, like yeah, salty, that's what savory salty, candy would be. Salty yeah. licorice is a savory. It's so sweet. But it's, yeah, but you can have. Sour plums. Uh, yeah, bitter candies. Those are fine. Citrus candies. Bitter lemon head. Okay. Hello, H N E K. It's candy. It's gonna be sweet. Show. Don't. That's what I'm saying. There's no such thing as savory candy. Sure there is. You just gotta look harder. Try more. Can- what, what's your candy? What's your go-to candy? Anything dark chocolate. Yeah, oh. dark chocolate. Um, um, my favorite least- candy in the whole wide world is a Take Five. Is that the mint or is that the eight the something eight one? It's like uh, there's no it's mint in it. Flaky thing. Okay, so it's it is a is it British. No, it's a <laughs> pretzel. 
It's peanut butter. Uh -huh. It's peanuts. It's caramel and it's chocolate. That's too much. That's a lot. Five things. Yeah. Take back. That's five things. That's, five things. That's a lot. That's too many things. But the pretzel. Mm. I love a dark chocolate covered pretzel also. That's some of my favorite Same. stuff in the world. My holidays. I like, I like a candy cane. That's like my one holidays of my are, are dark chocolate with pretzel and candy cane. I like just a candy cane. They're hard to find, uh, honestly, a good candy cane supply once you get away from the season, uh, the Christmas season. But right after Christmas, that's when you got to stock up. They go on sale. You can get candy canes like, I'm just telling you people, like 70%, 80% off because they, they don't know what to do with them if nobody bought them. So you just buy up those right after the holidays. And you if you get enough, you can be good throughout the whole year. Oh, I do like candy corn. I don't understand candy corn. I don't know I why know. anybody it's would eat candy describe. corn. hard to describe. I like it. It's, it's, a, it's a texture. It's the texture for me. Yes. I really yeah, like the I, texture. The it is a confection. That's the I don't like about it. It's a confection. That's the thing I do. But I also don't like chocolate. Identity for I totally agree. Like American milk beans. chocolate is made of barf. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I don't like chocolate at all. It's I do not. like uh, jelly beans. Those are good. Yuck! I hate jelly beans. Mm. Oh, those are so good. <laughs> what city? What do you want? And good and plenty. Good and plenty. Oh, That's I a, love good and plenty. Yeah, I am a good. fan of good and plenties. I think I like all the pill form candies. <laughs> My I feel like I... those are all candies that a dentist would hate for you to eat. Also, yeah, yeah. all the candies get that get stuck in your teeth, so that yeah. they like really wedge in there with the sugar. Just get in. Yeah. What was Thank the you, one? Noodles. What was yeah. the one called? I, it was a hard candy, cherry candy with gum in the middle. Oh, oh that one was really good. It was it called gum a cherry in the gum? middle? It was called, uh, yeah, it was like a butter. Brock's. And you could get it in the thing, but they were, it was cherry hard. Like, and I don't understand too. When you buy candies, you should just be able to buy the flavor you like. Like all the cherry candies are good. And all the other ones they package with them are bad. Like, some of the lime ones are good too. But like, that's what you need to buy. Be able to buy all the cherry lifesavers. Anything with red dye. What is it? Red dye number 40. It's, you make whatever good color. One. It's, it's the, the it's the cherry. It's like the yeah, and it goes with the cherry flavor, and it's just so good. It's what mm -hmm. it, they use it to addict you. You like it because a, it's addictive. I had a friend do the thing where you uh, can taste the difference between the colors of the M and M's. Mm, but it's I can't. yeah. So there's like five or six different ones, but whatever it is, you have you have to have an audience where you have some people in on it. Oh who yeah, are giving a clue. Like if it's a yellow one, you know somebody's blindfolded and they're doing. Oh, this like, test. like <sighs> yeah, somebody's gonna uh, cough or n say a sound, or if they don't, if nobody says anything, then it's this color. You have to have like this all system all figured mm -hmm. out. But I've seen it pulled off where people were being amazed by someone's mm -hmm. ability to tell what the flavors were. May I help you, little girl? Somebody wants to go to bed. <laughs> She's like, it's early. You're, you're, you're what? It's like, it's early now. What? Yeah. She's like, you sat down. That means it's time for bed. <laughs> Sitting down means something very specific. Kind of that is also when she gets so bad. A, uh, I don't understand uh, it. Perfect. Although I will say, yeah, it's the little chocolate makers. The, 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 it's like the. Boutique chocolate maker, chocolatiers. They make some really good dark chocolate. Milk chocolate, I'm not a fan of, but I'm sure that mm -hmm. they make it better. But there's a Portland com a Portland com company that I just came across that's called Honey Mama. And it is the most interesting chocolate bar. Mm -hmm. Has it got honey it's, in it? Yes. It's made uh -huh. with honey and cacao and... Oh, it's really delicious. And I, uh, if you get a chance to try Honey Mama, this is really good stuff. It's not a hard chocolate bar. It's kind of because it, the honey, it's like soft. Different. Mm, it's, it's a, a Portland exclusive. 
Yes, it's a Portland thing. It's delicious. Mm. Do you see what's <laughs> happening here? She's like, hi, hey, hey. I jumped up on the other the chair. chair. Hey, I will sit with you. Are we going to have she's, an interview now? She's Do taken to jumping on the chairs. Yeah. Nice. Is it treats time? Treats yeah, time? that's why she wants to go to bed. She gets a little. She gets like a little quarter cup of food when she goes to bed. <laughs> she's like, so bedtime, right? Bedtime. Bedtime. Is it bedtime? Yeah. Is it bedtime? It's because she gets she gets acid reflux. <laughs> Oh. So she she can't go to bed on an empty stomach, or she has a bad morning. Hmm. My little my cappy, my tabby cat. She likes she her favorite thing is bed because that means mm. cuddles. And so mm. she, when I start going upstairs, she runs in front of me. And she plops down on the ground and she rolls over and she shows me her belly and she gets oh. pets. And then she runs up the stairs some more and I run after her and she goes, meow, meow, meow. And she gets excited and she shows me her belly and then she runs up the stairs some more until she finally gets to the bed and she goes, ha. And she jumps in all the blankets and she gets, ha. Cute. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's pretty adorable. She's your cat, huh? She's, she's my cat. Yeah. Yes. You're my, she's here with me now. Aren't you Aww. here with me now? Pick her up. Let me see her. Where are you? Oh, she's showing me her belly. Come here. Yes. Come here, Chomp. Hi. <gasps> Yay. Can you hear her? She's like, I can. <gasps> oh, my goodness. Sadie, can you hear the cat? Here. Oh. Can you hear the kitty? She's like, I don't want headphones. I don't want them. Okay, that oh, is beautiful. <laughs> this beautiful creature has given me has given me all the toxoplasma, made me crazy, and I love her. She's an indoor cat, right? She's an indoor cat. Yeah, she's never yeah, been she outside. Yeah, give you toxo. Stephen from the chat room has pointed out that you can buy a five pound gummy bear on Amazon, and I had looked it up just because I'm like, no, you can. And yes. yes, yes, you can. You can. Why and would you? Should you? No. Somebody, you? I think, no. can I think you? Marshall, yes. yeah, Marshall bought one for Kai a couple of years ago for Easter. It was like no. a gummy bunny. Oh, no. And it was huge. It, it did weigh several pounds. I don't know if it was five pounds, but it was this massive thing. And Kai's like, I'm going to eat the whole thing. And I was like, uh -huh. no, I'm throwing it out. <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a barf waiting to happen. Five pounds of gelatin and sugar. Your now, nails and hair and skin would be fantastic. Any candy sounds like trouble. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's like, I mean, I'm sure you guys have read the um, Amazon reviews for the giant bag of Haribo gummy bears, right? What? Have, have done no, what? this is the thing that like... I love Haribo gummy bears. It circulated around the internet probably five years ago. But basically, <laughs> I'm going to find it. Wait, what is it? Reading I'm going to find it. It's the Amazon reviews. Gummy Why would you gummy read bears. the back of a, a candy package? It doesn't make sense. See you in hell, Haribo sugar-free gummy bears. <laughs> <laughs> So it's it's the sugar free gummy bears, and oh, there's just yeah, a million awful. there's a million um, reviews, and they're all somehow related to how uh, it makes you poop. Um, <laughs> and what? so there's also a number of five star <laughs> reviews specifically for how good they are at making you poop. So here I'm gonna I'll put that in the chat room. <laughs> Digestive overload, five stars. <laughs> five well, I bought these fully well knowing the consequences of my actions. However, the unforeseen events that followed include, but are not limited to. Um, yeah, I'm not going to read these out loud, but. <laughs> You're like, nope, nope. Will I read them out loud? No, I will not. No, I shan't. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Justin, you should read them in your voice. How else would I read them? <laughs> what other voice like would i did i put on a different voice do you want mine you can use mine borrow your voice just borrow it 
<laughs> That'll be good. Oh my goodness. Are you talking a disclaimer voice or is it are we talking the the uh the quotey voice? I don't know where the I can't I don't yeah, see them. great. Did you see it in the chat room? Oh, uh no, let me go over there and see. Oh, here's a five star review that is titled Tell My Mother I Love Her. <sighs> I ate it all. It's like pulling the pin on a hand grenade and swallowing it. <laughs> Only it decides when to go off. Oh, no. Gosh. That voice you do. That voice you do. That thing you do. Maybe quotey voice. Yes. Quote I like this one's called Don't Make Plans. <laughs> No, can it really be this explosive a diarrhea, Crosser? I mean, this says, surprise, bought these to give to a new group of scientists coming down to our station in Antarctica. They had the desired effect. Oh, my Ooh, goodness. Perfect so treat for coworkers who can't be nice. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's great. So there is an effect of some sugar substitutes because of the um, the sugar alcohols that are used that they can cause stomach upset, that they ca can cause gastric distress. And sometimes it results in constipation and other times it results in the opposite. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that a thing with, um, oh gosh, what's it called? The fake chocolate? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is a laxative? Yeah. What yes. is what's it called? It's not stevia. That's obviously that's something else. But um gosh, you can call it take five. Okay. <laughs> How dare. <laughs> See yourself out. No. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> not my favorite. Fake chocolate. What is fake chocolate called? <laughs> not carob. No web twenty one. No, not carob. <laughs> not carob. <laughs> Fake chocolate is carob, but this isn't what she's talking about. No. What's that? Yeah, I thought it started with an S. It's like xylohol. Well, no. For the, the stuff I'm thinking of, these sugar alcohols that are sugar alternatives, it, it's like xylohol mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. But it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Too close to colonoscopy prep. Bah, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I can't figure out what it's called that, uh, that I'm thinking of. But but carob chocolate also. Did you I think, copy from the a... website or did you write that? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> the stuff that can kill dogs. Yes. Oh no. Anyway, that was a whole thing. Oral formation well, let's moving. see. A lot of these, I guess it was only two years ago. Oh, it feels like a million years ago because it was pre-COVID, I guess. <laughs> right. Sugar-free Haribo. See what happens. Although, yeah. I just like Haribo for what they are. I mm -hmm. like them with the sugar. I like it. But I understand you made that up. Of course you did. Well <sighs> done. Well done, Identity 4. 10 out of 10 would read oh it again. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's great. Yes. So what should we plan for? Is there anything? We did the show. We've been doing the show. We get interviews. We did the DTNS twists crossover which is a fun extra thing to add excitement what is the next thing that we should aim for other than summer vacation no <laughs> well um i guess uh pretty soon live events are going to be possible again i know so there's that yeah, I don't know if we should think about that this year, but maybe I mean yeah. for next year, 
I think we should mm-hmm. start considering stuff like that again, if mm-hmm. possible. Definitely. I mean, as long as Justin's not living in Denmark. Well, he'll just have to plan his his extraditions accordingly. Where, where do you want to do something? <laughs> where do you want to go? Or maybe we should go to Denmark. Yes. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> Let's do a live, live show in Denmark. This is a great idea. Yes. <laughs> Um, I would like I would like to be invited to Denmark, and then I'll just hop over to Norway, go visit family, go see maybe. some fjords. Where'd Blair go? She's like, I'm out of here. What are you Hello. doing there? Turning Hello. off the camera. Hello. You know. you know things. Stuff and things. Just stuff and things. Bye, drive safe. Okay. Love you. Bye, Brian. <laughs> He's already gone. Okay. She's she's looking out the door at him. Or she she jumps up on the windowsill. Watch as you leave. What are we going to do? Wait, I missed the I, don't know. I was reading <laughs> it. So we're we're going on a we're going to there's going to be a big thing that we're doing. I don't know. He was just asking, like, what are we going to do next? I'm trying to think of things that we can do to... Get off the desk. Things, because it's always good to have things to look forward to. Oh, Is there something that, as a twist, we can plan or start thinking about looking forward to? Well, is there, like, a fun, like... Just watch like along i feel like the so the um the rover thing was a great example of something that we could have really orchestrated into something bigger hey we were there i don't know where you were but i was we there were for like, part of it i was there for part of it yeah were you yeah there? so if they're didn't notice me being there for, for Rude. Events. <laughs> yeah i think it would be fun because then you could like I don't know, especially if it was at the right time zone for some of us. We could have like a themed drink. We could all mix up a drink together. We could bake something all your ideas related. Are about drinking. We could, you know, I just said bake. If you not, okay. Anyway, or drinking or like, getting baked. Like, okay, that's not what I. Okay, but anyway, other things. We could um, definitely, we could definitely, I mean, the James Webb Space Telescope, which, I mean, if it actually is going to launch, we could try to do a thing on October 31st. We could all dress up like the telescope. <laughs> Where is it what? launching from? Um, uh, it um, so far is... It's okay. I don't want to go. It's going to be Florida or Texas. It's probably going to yeah. be someplace awful like that. Yeah. I don't want to go. I also think it would be fun to do like a watch Sorry, along. Sorry, Florida and Texas, but you're a watch both along. We could do a, Yeah, Florida. we could do a watch um, along. Of other things too, like a movie. I don't know how that would work. We'd have to like get the rights or something or... No, we could do something like we could easily do that. People yeah. on Twitch do it all the time where okay. we all, we sit and react and watch and people are in the chat and then we all hit the start button hit the hit go at the same time yeah i think that would be super fun or yeah people do it like like a star trek movie or um contagion i don't know (laughs) once we're out of this perhaps or um yeah I don't know. It just French there's Yana. there's always oh, wow. science fiction movies. I feel like I'm always like yelling at the screen about the the pseudoscience and making funny predictions about what's gonna. I don't know. I think it might be fun to do some sort of watch along or something like that. Just low key like something people can participate in. It's a great like idea. Her. Okay, we can pick some movies. Try and do a watch along. We could yeah. we could have a vote. We could do. <laughs> we could do a, Oh, I love Buckaroo Banzai. That's a great one. We've talked about that before, and I still have never seen it. You what? shouldn't. Uh, save it until uh, the actual show. Yeah. Oh, you haven't seen it? Perfect. No. Okay. Great. Well, that's no. it. What that's is it available <laughs> on? <laughs> I what is this says, movie? Ooh, we can hate oh, watch Armageddon. This is the, greatest... the Eighth Dimension. This is the greatest movie in the history of movie making. <sighs> Uh, yeah, we could do watch parties. It's, John yeah. Lithgow, Jeff Goldblum, Christopher yeah, Lloyd, got all of Clancy the Clancy Brown, most people. 
Oh my mm -hmm. god! It's got all of the most important people of the of movies in it. All okay, I I don't want to read the plot section. I just want like the teaser, like one sentence version of what yeah, it's about. That's fine. It, it's Isn't you can it read. There's not enough words to contain the movie without seeing the movie. That's what how good that movie is. It there's does no have words. very few women. It's very very few women. Hmm. But it, but it's great. It's a great movie. It looks like maybe it's on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. it is maybe. It's it moves around. Uh, Buckaroo Banzai doesn't like to sit in one place for too long. Uh, What's going on? Uh, Amazon sometimes maybe. It's, sometimes it's on the Amazon. Sometimes it's on the Netflix. Sometimes it's uh, you know, it could be. Oh, anywhere. it's four dollars on Amazon, but that'd be fine. It could be anywhere. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh yeah, we could we could all just rent it. We could we could rent it and watch it or we could figure something out. Yeah. Oh, a watch party would be so much fun. There's another greatest movie ever too. Uh but uh I don't know if that that's the one I can never find. Which one is that? Uh, let me see if I've even got the name right. I think it's called Hello, Turtle Complex. Hunt 2. Howdy. Greatest movies ever made. We okay, need your yeah. votes. Is this it? Yes. I wonder if there's anywhere to see this. There's a movie <laughs> called Complex World that was made in 1991. Uh, it's the second greatest movie of all time that nobody's ever heard of. Oh, this uh, is the one that's not available anywhere that you no, were talking about before that like you worked on. One. No, okay, this, this is, is not the one, one you worked on. <laughs> this is not one I worked on. Actually, it's weird that it's 1991. I thought this was an older movie than that. That's curious. So it looks like there's a show maybe that's older. No, this is but Complex World has a cameo by Captain Lou Albano. If that it means anything to anybody who's listening, uh, it is. It, I don't know that any of the actors were allowed to act again after that movie, but it is still still one of the greatest movies of all time ever. Not it's not up there with Bucker Banzai. That is the greatest movie of all time ever, but it is uh, you know it's up there. Casablanca, Eric and AK. That's a good one. If, yeah, it is, except it's going to be annoying because all I'm going to be doing the whole movie is pointing out how this, all the set dressing is shadows. It's just lighting and shadows. Like, did we you could, see? Look, here. Um, Look at this scene. Look at the awesome. lighting. Look at the lighting. It's just shadows. See, and you feel like you're in a club and there's lots of plants everywhere. There's none. It's just shadows. When I don't want to watch Black Mirror. Oh, I saw the episode um, that it's was so dark, like Star Trekky, and it was great. But it was definitely it gave me nightmares. Black Mirror gave you nightmares. Yeah, Doom. yeah. Mm. Well, I haven't seen all the episodes. Nightmares I've only seen a couple. No Blair, check your me. IRC messages. I don't have any. Hey, puppy. I don't I have any. Something. You ate oh. dinner. What's going on? What's going so on? I do. Oh, I'm not doing a bit torrent. Thanks, Hot Rod. <laughs> I am all good on that. <laughs> you could bit torrent. No, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I don't have what you need to do that correctly. Uh, the last, <laughs> the last time I tried to bit torrent. Yeah, exactly. I would have to do all that, which I don't currently do. It's fine. Oh. Yeah. No, no, I'm good. I don't need. I don't need to get in trouble with the fuzz. So much shedding. The digital fuzz. Hi. May I help you? <laughs> I get and I get too. I get too irritated watching sci-fi though. Mo most sci-fi stuff. Cause it depends I, on the sci-fi. Yeah, I feel like we I, should watch like Planet Nine from Outer Space. Like I feel like we should watch something like very old, 
so that it's understood that it's going to be terrible. But they're probably going to have some stuff that's like weirdly prescient, you know? There's always right. one or two things where you're like, what? What? <laughs> Yeah, but then like they're still using 19, pen and pencil in space. Night watching a 1940s, yeah, 1940s sci-fi. It's like, because of global warming, we've needed to move our entire planet's population to Mars. Like, wait, what? That's what we're doing now. How did we How figure did you that know? out? Because it's not new. It's My not mom's new. been watching. Oh gosh, I, if she was Elon got she, his ideas from a movie. <laughs> Elon yeah. got his ideas from the people who came up with the ideas, and then he bought yeah. them. Yeah, of course. That's what happened. Yeah. Um, yeah, my mom's been watching some old sci-fi show on YouTube. I can't remember what it's called, but they keep getting on their space of phones. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and then they're, they're just out in space, space like, doing this. <laughs> we can do a whole hey, show. Hey, Blair, are you in space? Yeah, yeah, how'd you know? Both of you are in space, man. It sucks being oh, tied he? down by gravity like this. How are you in space and I'm not? I'm on a space moon right now. There's keys in space now. <laughs> We're in space. That's amazing. My son's favorite movie until just recently was The Cat from Outer Space. Oh, not familiar. Movie from the late sixties, I believe. I don't know that one. Uh, we could do. There's like a whole bunch of episodes of The Outer Limits, mm. which are fun. Which was like the um, like a mm -hmm. I think earlier type of version of Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, with usually side effects that included somebody with a flashlight. I think putting a light on the wall. Like, oh, there's a dot of light on the wall moving around. <laughs> oh, we're in space. It was a little bit of that in the early episodes. Yeah. But uh, some of them are very well, very, very well written. Some of those 1953 um, version of War of the Worlds, huh? Or Space yeah, 1999. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, we could also watch Independence Day. I feel like that's been long enough now that some of it would be good and some that of it's it would old. be cringy. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think the fascinating part of that one is going to be Here's a common threat to all humanity. Let's rally oh, together to were? take it on compared to like what's been going on in the pandemic where some people are like, I don't even believe there's aliens blowing up city. Like, okay, we can't. Oh, see, that's what we should watch. Mars Attacks. I love Mars Attacks. I've been saying I wanted to rewatch that recently. That's a great movie. That one's fun. That would be very fun to watch. Very fun to watch. What right, is so the there's one, a bunch of ideas the out there. The, we'll figure. The, we'll, I think it, this means that we do need to have a watch party. That we need to have like a regular watch party, or we need to make mm -hmm. a few dates to watch some movies together. Well, we could always watch uh, Futurama. <laughs> it's pretty. It's pretty appropriate. It's Very awesome. appropriate. Oh, whatever, Blayla. <laughs> watch uh, Bender's Big Score. It's the best one of the movies. <sighs> Wait, wait. Are you meaning Futurama, the Futurama movie, or just the? As, as I said, uh, Bender's Big Score is the best of their movies, yes. so we could watch the movie. Mm. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> what are you looking at? Hot huh? Rod says he can find all the movies. Yes, the Avengers, the British TV series. There's great. There's oh, so many ah. great things. We can find something. We could have fun. Watch movies. Yeah, on Twitch, watch parties. Let's do it on our Twitch channel. I think that would be good. Yeah, Turtle that Hunt. I was it. just having this conversation with my loved one about whether you could put put your head in a stasis or in a tank, and if you would do it. And uh, yes, <sighs> I mean you could right now, but the tank would be full of formaldehyde. Right, and I wouldn't be alive still. <laughs> That's not exactly what you want. If you could stay alive and like aware, I would 100% do it. No. Yeah. Why? Why? Like so later, like when I'm going to die anyway. And then you'd just be ahead in a tank. Yeah. And... <laughs> you learn every language 
Like, spend all day on the internet learning new things. But would you, though? I mean, yes. it's not going to change human laziness. You're still just going to be like, I'm going to watch Netflix. I'm sure. Change the channel. Why not? <laughs> you need more time to consume content. Listen to podcasts all day. <laughs> I'm ahead in a tank. I can listen to all the podcasts in the world. Yes. <laughs> Especially if, like, my jar would be near my loved ones who also would be dead if they weren't in a jar. Be great. You know, I feel like we should be a little bit this more self This is romance. It's romance. <laughs> yeah. I want to, I want to, I don't want to die. I want to be suspended. My head in a tank next to your head in a tank. This is the exact eternity. conversation that we have. <laughs> <laughs> I love you so much. Yeah. I want to be right next to you forever it's with like, my head in a jar. We have so much fun just talking to each other. Why don't we just do this for all eternity? It'd be great. Oh, my God. How long is eternity? A really long time. It's a long time. It's a long time. It's older than you. H N E K. Okay, so H N E K is in the YouTube chat room is saying after quarantine I realized I have no ability to learn or better myself. Now let me address this really quickly. Not bettering yourself during quarantine does not mean you're lazy. And it does no. not mean you don't have the ability. We were in the middle of a traumatic experience. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we were in a just, joint if you trauma. you didn't use the time to have a pandemic hobby, that doesn't mean uh, anything. <laughs> no, it actually, it, does, it oh, doesn't mean anything it at all. Is so there's this, it... whole, there's this whole thing about like pandemic guilt for people yes. who like decided they were going to pick up things or finally clean out that closet or whatever. And they were like, well, if who I didn't? didn't take the time now, I'm clearly never going to. No, you are in trauma, you are in fight or flight, and you were trying to move through this forever unknowing, questionable state. So like mm -hmm. psychologists have weighed in and said, that's not what this means. To expect yourself to like take advantage of this opportunity. Some people didn't, that's great, but it is totally unrealistic. And like, mm -hmm. I just, I just want to give you all... The permission the to not have done anything productive with yeah, your have, quarantine. Have compassion for yourself. <laughs> if your house is not cleaner than it was before pandemic started, that's fine. Yeah. It is okay. We were in limbo. It's been a hard, it's been a hard time. Yeah. It just, yeah. Well, and especially, like, and for like me, to... I was like, I'm going to clean out my wardrobe. I'm going to, like, really get rid of stuff. But part of the problem is I don't want to get rid of any clothes because I don't know what my life will look like on the other side of this and what I actually need to wear. So, like, that whole idea of getting rid of things that you haven't <laughs> worn in a year, <laughs> if I did that, I wouldn't have any pants anymore. Like, it's... <laughs> It's not relevant to haven't say like I haven't worn year. this in a Oops. long time. Yeah. I haven't worn a dress in a year either. But that doesn't mean I'm never gonna wear a dress again. It might. Dresses are the worst, but still <laughs> it's Sometimes yeah, it's, it's really tough. Dress. It's tough to plan for the future when it's so unclear what the future will hold. I think <laughs> pants will still be a thing in the future. I yes, but that's the other thing is will pants fit the same at the end of ah. this pandemic? <laughs> Ah, I, now I understand the, the That's nuance. That's the other problem. The nuance to what you said. Nuance. Yes. Yes. That's why I only own stretchy pants. Oh, man. Stretchy pants TM. To help you plan for the future. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I've never been more tempted by that Instagram ad for dress pants that are yoga pants. <laughs> <laughs> My fingers really hovered over that button quite a bit, but... I've not bit. What do you mean hovered? Mine was like, bye, bye, <laughs> bye. <laughs> I will get those. Yeah. Yes. Comfy yoga pants with pockets. Yes. I'll take it. <laughs> Gord says that pants are extinct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I do. If we I were do. Sponsored actually by still... a pants company, there would be a problem. <laughs> 
I, on an average day, I will say I wear three different kinds of pants. So I wear <laughs> I wear my what? workout pants to go for a run pants. in the morning. Mm-hmm. I wear some version of sweat or yoga or pajama pants to work in from home. Workout and I pants. put on and I yeah and I put on real like jeans with pockets to take the dog sweat for a walk because I need pockets to take the dog for a walk. And I then I come back pants. home. Workout pants and then sweatpants. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. What I wear. The sweatpants go on immediately when I return from the walk, for sure. It's like one comfy pair of pants after another. Yeah. I'm well, like, you gotta Let's change just it up. Go back to normal business. <laughs> I am yeah. comfortable. Yeah, yeah. I'll I will, I will tell nice. you. Yeah, the <laughs> in-person conferences—they better be yoga conferences. Yeah. that's all I'm saying. The other thing that I'll <laughs> never be the same about ever again is uh, is underwires. <laughs> I yes. oof. I think I can count the number of times I've worn one of those since this all started on one hand. Ooh. I should have just gotten like full zod- full body flight suit kind of things. Yes. Jump suits. That would have jumpsuits. Oh, I love that. Yeah, th- there was a jumpsuit I was looking I at. I missed that opportunity the other day and it was like $150. It's like that's not the point of this. No, thank you. Oh, this was this oh. one, one idea. Justin Sorry, I've it. been what are you doing? Totally, but it's really amazing. Children, we Justin's a robot. You're back. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. I'm trying to suggest uh, the movie City of Lost Children, but uh, apparently the robots have gotten a hold of me. The robots. The lost children have come for you. That's a good movie. I haven't seen that one in a very long time. Yeah, I forgot about that movie. That's a pretty That's a uh, visually awesome looking movie. Yeah, you're right, Thunder Beaver. I think Justin's torrenting right now. That's why. Yeah, he's downloading. <laughs> downloading movies. I, I gotta go. Guy. I gotta go start the day. Go uh, make some breakfast. All right. Nice. Well, go start the day, Justin. We are. We will end our night, and yeah. we will all say goodbye at this point. I think it's time. Yeah, say good morning, Justin. Good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. (laughs) Good night. Good night, Kiki. (laughs) Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode. We will try and figure out some kind of movie thing. Do a movie watch party. I think that could be a lot of fun. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Have a wonderful week. Stay healthy. And be happy as much as you can. Let's make it through to next week with more science. We'll see you there. Please come back.